Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 252. Today's episode is one that I have been looking forward to bringing to you, the fine listeners of Shop Talk Live, for a long time now. Andrew Hunter joins me on this episode. And if you don't know who Andrew Hunter is, he is, first and foremost, an astoundingly good woodworker. The things he builds are just incredible, beautiful, functional. Andrew just looks at furniture and tools in a way that inspires me and most everyone else around him. But also, Andrew is regarded as an expert in all things Japanese hand tools. And that's what we're going to be picking his brain about mostly today, especially focusing on Japanese hand planes. If what Andrew has to say about Japanese hand tools inspires you to dig a little deeper, of course, I'll have links to articles and videos on finewoodworking.com in the show notes, but also check the show notes page for a link on October 24th, a couple days after this is coming out, Andrew is doing an online introduction to Japanese hand tools through CAS USA. If that's of interest to you, super cool opportunity to dig in a little bit deeper and pick Andrew's brain. Again, I'll have a link in the show notes. All right, that's enough introduction for this episode. Quick reminder, if you're web savvy woodworker, head on over to the show notes page and send in your application to become the next assistant digital editor of findwoodworking.com. And we'll pick up this episode after a brief word from our sponsors. Indulge your love of building beautiful things with the curated collection of top title picks for woodworkers of all levels at the Taunton store. From the 2021 Fine Woodworking Archive to must-have digital project plans and much more. Plus, don't miss Michael Pekovich's new book, Foundations of Woodworking. Check out today's deals at tauntonstore.com and save 30% in the Taunton store with the code PODCAST. So Andrew, uh, I have been hoping to make this happen somehow or another for a few years now. And I have been saving questions for you for a few years now. Good. Um, and there are few people who, um, who I can think of in the world who not only uh, exhibit the expertise with a style of woodworking, but a respect for the culture. And um, can you tell us a little bit about how your, about how you discovered um, Japanese tools and techniques and how that came about for you? You bet. Uh, 20 years ago, I opened Toshio Date's book, um, which I have here somewhere. Um, <laughs> his traditional, uh, his um, Japanese tools, spirit and use. Uh, and, and at that point, I had been using hand tools. You know, I had been using Western tools maybe five years and opened that book, and it was the beauty of the tools, really, that struck me first. So uh, just aesthetically? Seeing, aesthetically, I was drawn to them. You know, they just looked awesome. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then I read it, and, and it was really that tradition uh, that he spoke about, you know, his apprenticeship, um, his devotion to the craft. You know, that really inspired me, that, that sort of that level of commitment to the craft. You know, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, a way of life. Um, and so that, that really got me going and, you know, I'm in my twenties looking for inspiration and that, that started it. Um, and from there I went to a, uh, I was lucky enough to go to a, a Kazirakai, uh, USA event. Um, and they, th this is in California in about 2001 and that, that sealed the deal. This, this is Kazirakai. So what is, yeah. yeah. What is Kazirakai? What is, yeah. what does that stand? What does that translate? As. Uh, basically planning group. Um, planning was, group. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Basically, uh, people geeking out about hand planes, uh, <laughs> in, in Japan. So it was first started in Japan, um, as a way to preserve the craft really. And this is like 30 years ago. Um, and, and educate, you know, the, the public in Japan about traditional Japanese woodworking. So we, we have, uh, I, I'm part of it now, uh, have a, have a USA chapter, mm -hmm. um, and it, it's the same idea. We're just trying to spread the word about Japanese, traditional Japanese woodworking, how awesome it is, um, and about the tools and, the, and you know, the joinery and it, all, all of it. Um, mm -hmm. so, I, so I went to this event, 
and they had Japanese carpenters there. And it, it just, you know, it was, it just blew my mind. Like it was, it was what I felt like woodworking was supposed to be like, you know, this, mm -hmm. it was just so intimate, you know, and, and so much skill uh, and the hand plane six inches wide, taking perfect shavings. It was like, I was done, you know? So yeah. I was pretty much since then I've been on that page. Yeah. Um, have you, have you traveled to Japan? I finally did. Um, <laughs> just a few years ago. Yeah. Um, and what did you do while you were there? Uh, it was a guided tour, actually, through uh, the president of Kazerkai USA, uh, led a tour, uh, not not specifically for Kazerkai USA members, but uh, uh, there were seven of us. We, he rented a van and he just took us around to the, you know, the best woodworking uh, <laughs> around. Uh -huh. uh, and that was very inspiring. Um, what did like what did did you visit any blacksmiths or yeah yeah it was uh I, it, it was it was such a whirlwind honestly it, it was yeah. it was almost too much for me um i'm a i, I move pretty slowly uh kind yeah. of a guy and it was two weeks of of all, everything every day um yeah. where, my, where where it was too i was almost too full by the end of it and trying and I to think drink I'm, from a fire hose and and i'm yeah. still processing you know it's, okay uh, yeah um, but it was, I think the thing that I really left with is that level of commitment. Again, that level of commitment from the craftspeople, um, and, and the amount it's changing, uh, and the amount, uh, younger people in Japan are not embracing that tradition as, as much, uh, they're embracing more of a Western tradition. Um, you know, they're moving into the cities and getting jobs <laughs> and earning mm -hmm. money. Uh, as opposed to uh, toiling over a temple for your uh, your lifetime, mm -hmm. um, so there was seeing that made me sad, I guess, for uh, lack of better words, uh, to see that slipping away and to see how special it is, and uh, it, it just made me want to work harder when I was back here, you know, educating about it, you know, sharing it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so Kazirikai. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, you can call it Kez. Kez, Kez. Kez is easy. Yep, Kez okay, for sure. Okay, Kez. I'll yep. do Kez. <laughs> Good. Um, you, you give, uh, I guess in these days, you give Zoom classes through, yeah. through Kez, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yep. um, in in normal times, we'll say there's still meetups or and planning That's, competitions? Or? Yeah, yeah. So we, okay. we have these live events um, generally once once a year, at least one or two a year. Um, and it's, it's everything, you know, the, the planning contest is sort of the grand finale at the end, but really it's, it's so much more than the, the planning contest. And, uh, so yeah, so since the pandemic, um, we have switched to zoom, which has honestly turned out great for the organization. Um, yeah. I, I think we're, we have some catch up on the legwork of organizing all that. Um, but we are now reaching people you know, all the way across, you know, the States and beyond. We, we, we sort of stretch our meetings are usually at like two o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday, Saturday. So we can get Hawaii to Finland is, uh, as, as far as, as, as we can, you know, from eight in the morning <laughs> to nine at night. That's the, uh, yeah. uh, cause they, these are all live. Um, yeah. for now we're again, looking to maybe start recording some things and selling videos. But, uh, again, we're, we're fairly new at it and we're mm -hmm. run, Predominantly by a bunch of woodworkers. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so we. Not always we have, the most organized and social <laughs> bunch. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we we have some things to work out, but we're we're growing, you know. And it's, yeah. And for me, it just it it really felt like a good place to put my energy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a really it's it's what I want to do. It's what I uh, want to share with with people. Uh, and Kazerkai was it was is a great sort of um, venue to do that through. Um, and, and, and we're all sort of working together. It's, it's everyone who's, who's got an inclination towards Japanese tools. You know, we kind of want to just get you together. Um, and, and so we can have a louder voice. Um, you know, I, this, this, uh, I hesitate to ask this question, but you, the work you do, the woodwork you do, because you are not just a, an enthusiast, you're not just, um, and not just, but you're, you're not someone who, uh, who collects tools, 
you use them and you use them to make, if any listener out there has not seen Andrew's work, it is of the highest level. And I can promise you that everybody in the fine woodworking uh, magazine website sphere agrees that Andrew, and don't listen to this, Andrew, yes. Andrew's work is, <laughs> is just absurdly beautiful and probably the finest work you're likely to see in your lifetime. But it can, um, be, it can be blessed. Then. <laughs> I'm, glad this, I'm glad this is a podcast. But let me ask you this. And I think I know the answer. Is your if you could only build furniture or only spread the message, spread the the gospel of Japanese tools and woodworking techniques, which would you do? Um spread the word. And if building really nice furniture spread the word better, then yeah. I would choose that. But really I want to change craft. You know, that's, that's my bottom line it is I, yeah. I cherish it. Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, for, for the quality, uh, that people can get out of it, you know, it's not just the object itself that we're making it. It's the quality of life that making an object, uh, gives to someone. And that's, that I, I want to see. And that's, that's why the Japanese hand tools, um, have that connection. It, it is really, it's all about connecting to the material and the tools and the wood. And there's nothing in between you, um, mm -hmm. to, to sort of distract you, you know, it's, uh, that's a hand tool woodworking in general, you mm -hmm. know, it's, uh, I, I'm not only for Japanese hand tools. I just see that, uh, there is so much there to offer, um, uh, the world. And in terms of, learning more about hand tools and, and having a better experience with them, having better hand tools, you know, having blacksmith blades, um, all that is, is what I'm after sharing, you know, and to improve the craft so that my kids, <laughs> um, when they grow up, you know, craft is still strong, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, it's still an important um, career choice or life mm -hmm. choice, I should say, you know? Yeah. 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 Yeah, because even if you're not making a career out of it, it's it it can be a lifestyle. And, yeah, um, and, and, it, and it helps inform everyone. everything you do. You know. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, should should we get to to some questions? Sure. <laughs> we've got a lot. <laughs> yes. And um, and we've got a lot of hand plane questions. First off, let's let's get some terminology down. Great, kana. Kana. Yep. Kana is hand Japanese plane. for uh, hand plane. But but honestly, I um. I don't get stuck on the words. Yeah. Um, I, I probably could get stuck a little bit better. I mean, words, English words have a hard time sticking in my brain, <laughs> much less you, you throw yeah. in a whole nother language. It's, it's too much for me, but, but again, it's, I don't want to keep the words. Uh, the word shouldn't keep uh, the tools out of people's hands, you know? Yeah, so okay. if, if you want to call it a Japanese hand plane, please, you know, that's, yeah. that's what I call it mo most just, of the time. Just as long as someone's picking it up, you don't care. Yeah. Pick it up, learn <laughs> but, how to use it and use it. You know, so, but for, for the sake of, um, whatever. Yes. So Kana is a hand plane. Mm -hmm. Die. Die is, is the body. Okay. Of, and that's of, D -A -I? Of the hand plane. I? D A I. Yep. Okay. And what is the blade again? An awesome piece of cutting <laughs> steel. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there a name that, that traditionalists Probably. would go up? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's not get hung up on it all right yeah. so um this first question is from Corey, and we you you and i decided this is probably the best place to start uh from Corey, can you help me understand how japanese hand planes work specifically how the bade bade how the blade is bedded let's get that word right blade right, blade that's <laughs> that's the english I, uh yeah. word for blade <laughs> I'm grasping. <laughs> I've done a reasonable amount of research and I still can't seem to grasp how the blade depth is set and adjusted. Is there a standard process for creating mortises and adjusting the depth? I'm sure you are the best people to turn to, which is why we're, we choose to turn to <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what, exp how, how is a Japanese hand plane adjusted? So, um, I have one, which no one okay. can see, but, um, it is really just a block of wood with a blade in it. Um, and as opposed to a Western plane, which has a flat um, parallel sided blade that's held in place with a, with a separate wedge, 
Okay. The blade itself of a Japanese plane is um, wedge shape. Um, okay. So it, it, it fits into slots that are, you know, matching that wedge shape. And that's what holds it. So it's the block itself, uh, you know, grooves cut in the side of the, uh, in, in the block that hold the, the tapered uh, blade in place. And so, um, and, and just like, you know, wooden body planes, um, you know, modern ones or, or older ones, it's adjusted with a hammer. Um, the fit, you know, is made perfect by the craftsman. When, when I first get this plane in the mail from, uh, Japan or, or the tool company I'm, I'm using here, um, the blade doesn't fit yet. Basically everything is 80% there, but, uh, it's up to the craftsman to do that last 20%, um, which I really prefer because, uh, you know, I care so much about this plane that last 20% I'm going to do my best at as opposed yeah. to uh, someone who's got to get it out the door uh, to start making the next plane. Um, so, so when it comes, that blade doesn't quite fit. So there is an adjustment. Um, I can, that's, that's a whole can of worms, but I'll just tell you, it doesn't fit and you gotta, you gotta make it fit. Read, read my article and find what Yeah. Yeah. We have, we, we have an article <laughs> that I, I will link to in the show notes. Great. So, um, but uh, okay. I'm, I'm kind of with Corey. Yep. It's wedged. So I would think that there's one positive spot that that blade fits. Yeah. So there How is you... some, some, um, there is some flexibility to the wood, which is why they choose, uh, this is a Japanese white oak, um, which is a little different than our white oak. It's, uh, it's almost as if our, um, hard maple and our white oak had a baby. Um, oh, and, okay. and what, what you get is, is two qualities. You get a flexible fiber, you know, the uh, white oak has a very flexible fiber. So it's really good at holding that blade. Um, it, the wood flexes a little bit and compresses and holds that blade tight as opposed mm -hmm. to if this were a hard maple block, um, it's doesn't have that flex and it would kind of vibrate out. doesn't yeah. hold it as well. Um, the problem with our white oak is that the pores are fairly open. You know, they're certainly more closed than red oak, but they are open compared to a Japanese white oak. Uh, and that's okay. a problem because then that starts, you know, on the bottom of your plane, you start getting junk filled into those pores uh, and you no longer have a flat bottom because you have interference, basically. Um, so, uh, again, the Japanese white oak is um, has that flexibility to hold the, the tapered blade, but also doesn't have open pores um, to, to make it slide better, basically. Um, okay, so I am... Wow. I, I had no idea. I think you and I have made like a half an hour long video on, on home planes and <laughs> right. I didn't. So, or, We're just getting started. Yeah. or I'm, it's the, it's the same look <laughs> of, of, of shock. Um, so, so white Japanese white Oak, um, it, it best of both worlds you know, there. Yeah. yeah. And, and there are, there are, uh, Western woods that, that work, um, beach would, you know, and, and traditionally okay. that's, that's, um, in the West, that's where we've made our wooden planes at a beach is a great wood, um, yeah. European beach, even better. Um, Osage orange actually, um, is turning into one of our champion woods. Um, very really? stable. Yep. Um, very, very stable, uh, certainly harder than, uh, than the Japanese white oak. A little more brittle, harder to cut the die and, and work the die, but very stable once it's in there. Um, so yeah, with there there are options, but those those are the sort of things you want to look for. It needs to have the spring in the fibers to hold the wedge blade, and it doesn't want to be an open poured wood um, mm -hmm. because those pores will fill up with gunk uh, on the bottom of the plane and, and cause trouble. Interesting. Now, um, I feel like we're going to veer off from the questions, but the conversation is just going there. So the bottom of the plane, though, um, if I remember correctly, is not f flat. Yes, and and I I think I want to hit on that. Like, there's so many things I want to hit on, but I know I want to hit know. on that on, so a, on, a, on a different question. The, okay. the placement right. of the blade really uh, gotcha. That's where we'll that go one. there next. Yeah. Okay, so uh, but so, so let's let's get back to the blade depth. So so the the wedged blade or the yep. the blade which is a wedge shape is set into a mortise in the plane mm -hmm. with a, with a opposing wedge or, or yep. with a opposing, uh, angles. Yeah. And the flexibility of the fibers in the wood give you just enough yep. adjustment. And, and honestly, most woods have that flexibility. It, it's yeah. most woods wouldn't bring you to a certain, you know, a one spot you have, you have that, uh, 
eighth of an inch, three sixteenths quarter of play. And, and mm-hmm. most of my planes, it's, you know, it's right around three sixteenths. I can put it in by hand and I maybe have another quarter of inch to go to get right, right out. Uh-huh. Um, and, and again, that's up to me to make that fit right. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah. so you get the plane and you, you immediately start, you know, we've already gone to the romance of it. You immediately start building this relationship with this tool. Exactly. By, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, what there's, we'll talk about wooden planes. There, there's some questions about wooden planes, but that's, that's really part of it is there's a connection. Um, I'm in charge of this plane. It, it, it works for me. I don't work for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, now uh, actual adjustment. Yep. Yeah. Adjusted with a hammer. Um, light taps on the blade. will set it in. Uh, and mm-hmm. I can tap on the left side of the blade or the right side of the blade to, to adjust it um, in and to take it out. Uh, it's similar to Western planes, although in a different location. And to be honest, this location, the Japanese location for tapping it out makes a lot of sense to me. The, the other one where sometimes there's buttons on the front, mm-hmm. um, those don't make as much sense to me. But so in a Japanese plane, you strike the back of the back top edge of the plane, um, basically parallel to the blade. And that vibration will draw it out. Um, okay. It will, it will, it will draw the blade back. And you can draw it to the left. You can draw it to the right, depending on whether you hit the left or right side of the huh. uh, the back edge. Uh, so there really is a hammer is a great way to adjust something. You know, it's it's I use it all the time, regardless of you know. It, people are often taken back by the the fact that there isn't a knob. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and, and hitting your plane with a hammer to adjust, it seems kind of crude and not very accurate. Um, but I, I disagree. You know, I, I use a hammer all the time in my work to make fine adjustments. If I clamp something together and want to yeah. move it right up to the line, I don't try to use my hands. You know, I yeah. tap it with a hammer because it, it gives, it, it gives a force and then it takes that force away. Whereas mm-hmm. opposed if I'm pushing with my hand, I have momentum and I have uh, inertia, I tap with a hammer, it gives it that force and then no more force, you know? Yeah. So I have, I have really a lot of control with, with, with a hammer. Um, and it just takes getting used to, you know, it, it, at first <laughs> it's weird, but, uh, I think I have personally found that, uh, I have a lot of control adjusting with a hammer. Um, so when you are, cause you, you teach a lot. Yeah. Um, What's the learning curve like for your students? Uh, is it just, you know, setting up the, setting the blade a few times and then all of a sudden you, you start to build that muscle memory or, um, or is it over the course of months you, you acquire the skills? Months. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> many months, you know, I, and yeah. that's, that's my way of woodworking. Um, years. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's my mentality on, on learning things. I, I don't, uh, I don't expect to get there in months. Um, but you get you a patient man. I am you a patient, are a patient man. man. I am a yeah. patient man. Um, and, and deliberate though. It, I've, I, you know, you've, you've told the, the story before about how you, you, you thought about the tools for a long time before you even picked them up. You sure. Know? So, yep. um, but if, well, I guess there's a lot to be learned from just slowing down and setting expectations to an appropriate level. And, yeah. uh, yeah. So, so enjoying, when, enjoying the process, you know, really, yeah, okay. really it's, uh, seeing the horizon, seeing where you want to be, um, and setting that horizon far, you know, not, mm-hmm. not shorting yourself. And taking your time to get there and knowing that it is going to take you a lifetime to get there. <laughs> yeah. And, and the getting there is, uh, that's, that's the pleasure, you know, that's, that's the woodworking, that's the practice, that's the learning, that's the growing. It's like, those, those are the things I enjoy in my shop. It's, yeah. it's almost sad when the piece is done, you know, and it, and it goes, <laughs> I'm lonely, <laughs> you know, I it's, it's like, now I'm just drawing stuff. I want to, I want to work, <laughs> um, get back into the process. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's for teaching. I, I, obviously I understand that everyone's coming at it at a different level. Um, but just to get the plane to work, 
is a two day class. You know, I'm, okay. I'm you know, I'm teaching one uh, in October at uh, with Bob Van Dyke at uh, Connecticut Valley, and that that's a that's a weekend course. Yeah. Um. And and so, you know, just getting it working is already <laughs> two solid days, and then you know, as much as you can use it. You know, that's that's the thing. If you want to learn how to use a hand plane, unplug your power planer. You know, it you mm-hmm. just have to use it. It doesn't matter if it's Japanese or you know Western. It's you just have to use a tool to get better at it. Yeah. Um, and spend lots of time, you know, depending on how much better at it you want to get, you know? Yeah. yeah. But if you want to take it all the way, plan to spend a lifetime at it. <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> I'm not there yet. I'm not even halfway there. You know, there's yeah, so there's, much more. Yeah. You know, there's, there's people who are 80 years old and still claim to be, and they've been doing it their whole lives and still claim yep. to be learning. So, mm-hmm. Um, all right, let's, let's hit this next question is from, it's from Ben, not me. Um, Mm -hmm. I've developed an appreciation for wooden planes over metal planes. They're lighter. One can make his or her her own wooden plane for the price of a $40 plane blade and some scraps. And most notice and most notably for this question, one can either pull or push wooden planes, depending on the grain angle, fatigue and positioning, making it more versatile than a metal plane. I've used the Krenov plane historically, plane historically, and I've used his general rule on where the plane opening should be on the sole in relationship to the length of the plane, which ends up being slightly in front of the midpoint of the plane. The same can be said for, for many historically wooden body planes, European style, we'll say. Um, however, I've noticed that the plane opening on a Japanese plane sits much further back on the plane body. While I understand the one predominantly is pushed and one predominantly is pulled, they both move in the same direction vis-a-vis the direction of the blade. Can you offer any insight into the placement of the plane opening on a wooden bodied plane? What explains the different placement in these two common forms, Western versus Eastern? Does one have an advantage over the other? And if one wanted to build a plane that they pushed would and pulled an equal amount, interesting, little yep. twist. Is there a magic compromise between these two positions? So 50%, <laughs> 50, 50, <laughs> right in the middle. Yeah. So the, at Can first it was wind? like, Oh, well, of course one is pulled, one is pushed, but then when he's, and he's right in relation to the direction, the plane is traveling, the blade is traveling to the wood. Mm-hmm. Why is one, two thirds of the way back and one, one third of the way back. This is my favorite question. Honestly, this, this, uh, the location of the blade is more important than pushing and pulling to me. Uh, first, let me start at the beginning of his questions. Wooden planes are wonderful. Uh, I agree. They, uh, that that's the first step is let's move towards wooden planes because, um, it puts you in control of, of your plane. You know, it, it Mm -hmm. puts you in control of adjusting, uh, the body, whereas a metal plane doesn't give you that. Um, basically, you can only take it as far as the company who made it, you know, and they're making really good <laughs> metal body planes. Um, but there's a limit, you know, because we're not, we're, we're woodworkers, not, not metal smiths uh, in terms of adjusting that plane to make it perfect. You know, mm-hmm. that last, that last 10% that they can't do in, in the, uh, in the factory because, it's just not feasible. Um, so the thing with the wooden plane is it gives you that ability to adjust and, and make it better. And we're woodworkers. So, you know, it, <laughs> that, that makes sense. Yes. Wooden planes. Yeah. Um, and in terms of location of blade, that's, it's a really interesting question. Um, I sort of dug into some of my other planes. I, I got an old, you know, 1850s plane, um, coffin smoother that, kind of, yep. yeah. And that's, that's the same relationship that he's talking about in a Krenov plane. It's yeah. uh, about 40%, um, the distance, the total distance, the, the blade starts at about 40% the way, uh, okay. and 60% of it is in the back, mm-hmm. um, which is similar to a Krenov, uh, according to what he was saying. Uh, the Stanley, you know, the, this is an old Bailey. Um, these are more like 30%, um, mm-hmm. forward. So, like you said, the Japanese plane uh, is the exact opposite. The you know here's here's what I'll call the front, the the leading edge. Um, it's sixty percent 
um, the blade is placed at 60%. Mm-hmm. So it's the same relationship as a Krenov 60, 40, but, uh, like he was pointing out, the majority of, of the plane is in front of, of, of a Japanese uh, blade. And this is so important, um, mainly because uh, the front in front of the blade is the most important part of the whole plane. Um, okay. You know, we, we all agree uh, that a tight throat opening can do so much in, in terms of preventing blowout um, and, and creating a nice shaving. Mm-hmm. Uh, so really having a tight throat is important, but if that throat is not in contact um, because it's worn out, um, then it, it's moot, you know, it's, 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 it's all about the contact, um, the blade makes where the blade contact or the body contacts the wood when you're pulling it. And in a Western plane, they are perfectly flat. Uh, so when you put that plane down, the entire body, you know, the entire bottom of the plane is touching. Uh, mm-hmm. so you're having to share that pressure, um, okay. pressure, pressure equals force over, uh, area. Okay. Um, So because we know it is so important to compress those fibers right before they are cut and as close to the cut as possible to prevent blowout, that is, that is essential to a hand plane. What Western or or Japanese holding those fibers down as close as you can to the cut will do so much for blowout. Um, So what a Japanese plane has done is it has relieved everything but that area. So like you were saying before, the bottom of a Japanese plane is not flat. It touches only right in front of the blade, you know, maybe a quarter inch uh, all the way across and in the very front of the blade or, or in the very front of the block, the leading edge. So there's so so all of your force is being transitioned into pressure right where you need it. Yes. Um, Goodness. Exactly. And and not being held up, you know, when you put down a flat object, if there's any little bump or the board isn't perfectly flat then you are being held up in the middle at that spot that you need pressure the most right in front of the blade. You're not touching it. Um, and then if you have a metal body plane and it's, you know, inherited, uh, it's 50 years old, hundred years old, and there's been wear in front of the blade. Um, then you're never, you're never touching, you know, that most important part compressing those fibers right before they're cut isn't even happening. Um, so, so again, a wooden body, uh, means that I can adjust this and make it yeah. perfect. Make sure that that contact is happening right in front of the blade. And the Japanese basically amplified this by taking everything else out except for those two contact points. Uh, everything behind uh, the blade uh, on 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 the on the body doesn't touch the wood on a on okay, a rough that was plane. My, uh... Yeah, on a rough plane and a smoothing plane. I, I have joiner planes which have contacts, three contacts. They have a contact behind the blade. And in front of the blade uh, for to, flattening purposes. For flattening so purposes. Have, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But if I'm doing rough work or smoothing, all I want to do is take a consistently thin shaving. Um, so the back of the plane is relieved because I'm not trying to read the wood. You know, I'm not trying to make it flat at this point. I'm just trying to make it look, you know, a, a nice finish. Um, and that pressure is amplified right where it needs to be most. Um, and that that um, separates the Japanese hand plane from the Western plane. I, in, in my opinion, that is the most important thing is, is that, that idea of, of um, focusing that pressure where you want it most and not distributing it and not uh, having a metal body plane that you can't make, you know, you can lap a metal body plane, but it is not easy. Yeah. And, and often no, no. amateurs do more harm than good. Um, whereas, we're woodworkers. We can we can tune a uh, a, a wooden body. So so, so my uh, answer. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> no 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 no. Go com- continue. I uh, yeah. My my answer to him whether uh, you know pushing or pulling. It, that's the location of the blade. Put it put it in the middle if you want to do both. But if if you really want to focus where the focus needs to be, put it towards the back of the plane and start thinking more about the f- landing on the front of the plane. Um, yeah, because the way when you're pulling it, you are there's no other place you can apply that pressure really, except on those two spots. Uh, again, yeah, yeah, exactly. But pulling yeah. or pushing is the same, you know. So yeah. a Japanese plane or a Chinese plane is looks exactly like a um, Japanese plane in, in in the sense that the blade is set to the back of the body, 
um, but you push a Chinese claim. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'm actually not sure about the profiling of a Chinese claim. Okay. They, they might be flat. Um, but you push, you push, you know, that, that same relationship with the blade is in the, in the back, uh, in a Chinese plane, you push it. So, so really the push pull is not what's important to me, uh, most important about a Japanese plane. It's that, that sole profiling, that the fact that the, the sole of the plane is not perfectly flat and that it's, it's focusing attention where it needs it most. That's, that's huge. Yeah. All right. So. I don't think there's a question here about this, but I have a question. Please. Um, I know that it was, it was kind of a aha moment when I discovered that you use as shallow of a blade setting, if you will, or angle yep. as you can get away with. And I think that a lot of Western plane users think, oh, I'm going to get a 55 degree frog on this plane um, because it will reduce tear out. Um, and that sometimes equates to, in many minds, a better plane or a, a whatever. But when you use a, f a higher angle, you're more likely... You, you get a, you don't get as fine of a finish, right? Can, can you talk about the, the angle of the blade setting for a yep. minute? And, and there is a question before I keep up. going and no, but it. that's no, you're, this, this is great. <laughs> and, and again, an, another important difference between Japanese planes and Western planes is that blade angle. Yeah. Uh, and there is a question coming up about, uh, why does it look so much easier to, uh, oh, okay. To, yeah. All right. To, yeah. <laughs> to push a, or pull a Japanese plane than it does push a Western plane. Yeah, uh, and and really one of the biggest reasons is that blade angle. So, typically, you know, in, in the West, uh, a blade will be set at a, at forty five degrees. Um, in typically in Japan, that blade is set at about thirty nine degrees. So okay. its its bedding angle is lower. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, as you lower the bedding angle, um, the force vector. I'm going <laughs> to drop that on you guys. <laughs> Uh, the perpendicular force vector coming off of that blade, as it lowers, uh, there is more upward force. And as that blade uh, angle, bedding angle increases, there is more forward uh, force of that blade. Okay. Uh, and, it's, and it's all about how you're, you're treating those wood fibers. And some wood fibers um, are sensitive, <laughs> and, and we need to be <laughs> sensitive to them. And yeah. when, you, when you come at it with, with a higher, with a steeper bedding angle, um, and more forward force, um, some of those fragile wood fibers are going to fail instead of cut. And that is not a good surface. Yes, it didn't cause blowout, um, but it's, it doesn't leave as nice a surface um, as bringing that angle down. So, so in, in my work, it's, it's trying to figure out uh, the, that balance um, yeah. is being avoiding blowout and yet getting a, a really nice finish. I, I should say that's, that's also a, a difference in, in the culture. Um, the idea of a hand plane finish in Japan, that is the way. <laughs> yeah. um, sandpaper finish is, is not how uh, traditionally wood is finished in Japan. And it's all about the blade. You know, and it, that mentality comes you know, straight from samurai sword. The love of the blade and the love of the blacksmith and the skill for which they can forge that blade, um, that is held in that culture very high. Um, and so essentially to sand wood uh, is honestly, is disrespectful. You're, you're not treating it as well as you could by, by mm -hmm. cutting it with a blade. Um, and, and there's so many advantages to a hand plane uh, finished as opposed to a uh, sanded finish, especially exterior. Um, a sanded finish, no matter how fine is still scratches and it still leaves a fuzz and that, mm -hmm. that fuzz, those scratches, uh, are like wicks to moisture and dirt. They attract them and, and they, they suck them in, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a, a really well hand plane surface is so flat. It doesn't have that uh, fuzz. Um, and it actually attracts dirt. It attracts moisture much less. Um, th there are videos of dropping water on top of two surfaces, one that's sanded, uh, one that's hand planed and the hand plane, um, water droplet just sits on top of the wood. 
Huh. Uh, and you also send me a link to those. Yeah. yeah. And the sanded one just go. I'll I'll do the video. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll, uh, yeah. Um, no so, no link um, needed. And and also in your work, you strive to not use finish, right? You're going for the a a a luster from the actual wood. Exactly. Like yeah. Like like a lot of times we apply a thick film finish to give us a sheen, right? Yeah. And which is, I guess, in essence, making up for the the lack of sheen on what well, that lack of sheen wood. is a lack of a flat surface. You know, a scratch yeah. surface has all these little scratches, dents, voids in it, so that when light comes in and hits that surface, it defracts, deflects in in every direction. Mm -hmm. Whereas a uh, hand plane surface is so smooth that the light comes and reflects right off it, uh, mm -hmm. like a mirror. Uh, and so essentially what we're doing in the West and, and I do it too, you know, I don't, I don't mean to, um, sometimes when I get in a bind, I I'll break out some sandpaper and, uh, yeah. but, but after that, we generally put a film finish on top of that to create that level surface. Um, yeah. so it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I like getting that level surface right from the wood. Uh, and, and again, it, it really, I, and I, and I do use finishes, but mild finishes, you know, pure, pure tongue oil or, uh. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, are you still hand planing your floorboards? I'm done hand planing. Now I'm finishing. Okay. I told my, <laughs> I, I was, my, my, my wife and I were on a walk the other day and I was like, Oh, Andrew Hunter's going to be on the podcast. I was like, this guy's like hand planing his floorboards. And like, he's not even going to put finish on him. He's just going to put oil on it. So it doesn't stain. And she's like, Whoa. <laughs> um, soap finish. Um, you're doing a soap, soap finish. Flake finish. Yep. Okay. Uh, it's as close to, uh, you know, it's basically like doing nothing, but, uh, yeah. takes longer <laughs> 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 and, it, and it hurts your back more. <laughs> um, but it is exactly what I want out of a finish where I'm going to, um, I'm going to digress, but it is, uh, it's exactly what I want. You know, it's maintainable. You basically, you maintain it with the, with the finish. Um, yeah. And yes, it will get stained eventually, but yes, I will be able to clean that stain up with the exact product that I finished it with. Uh, and okay, it's, it, yeah. it's all about longevity. You know, that's, that's, again, I'm patient. You know, this floor is not about me. This floor is about my kids <laughs> and, and the next generation. You know, that's, those are the floors I love, you know, going in. Yeah. So I should say they're 16 inch wide white pine boards. Gorgeous. Yeah. Um, all hand planes. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout the whole house or just an area? Uh, about 700 square feet of it. Yeah. Wow. The, the whole house. Yeah. Everything and, in the uh, house is hand Cut hand. nails? Oh, yeah. 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 From, from Tremont? Did you Tremont. get them when we went up? All right. Nah, yeah. From Tremont. Who, 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 who did we see up there? Uh, Gary? I don't remember his name, but yeah, yeah, the, the, they're, they're the great fifth factory. generation nailer. Yeah, I think I think of them often up there. <laughs> so we, each of those nails, I reground because they were a little rough. Um, mm -hmm. Each yeah. of the thousand or so nails in my floor got reground on a grinder, uh, and then torched with a with a propane torch to turn them black. <laughs> oh, goodness. about about two minutes a nail or so. <laughs> There's a thousand of them. You're a patient so, man. I guess so. <laughs> with um, a patient family. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but right, we're moving in. Uh, sorry. That's, that's no, uh, no, 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 no. I was, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm I, finishing I was, the floors and we're moving in, which is, which is a huge event for me and a uh, life event. That's um, great. Yep. Yeah. You've and been working on that for a long time, a long time. And we've been living in my shop. So uh, really the life event is me moving into my permanent shop, which I'm that's really awesome. looking forward to. Yeah. So your shop, what is your, your permanent shop space like? Cause when I was there five years ago, you had, Oh, I'd say about 30 square feet. Um, and you had some power tools in the garage and, uh, what's the permanent shop going to be like? Not much different than what you've seen in the past. It's just, okay. I don't have to break it down every month. Um, cause I have yeah. been working in the house as I work on the house, I'm working in, you know, I'll take on a commission, stop mm -hmm. working on the house, set up in whatever room is available in the house I'm working on and, uh, do the commission, which, you know, it's not ideal. So, uh, having, just having everything where you want it, you know, mm -hmm. I'm just really looking. And 
the shop to me is, is more than just, it, it's my safe space. You know, it's mm-hmm. where everything is right. Yeah. Um, and, and it really doesn't need to be more than 10 by 10. Um, you know, once I'm outside of that space, I'm a slob, <laughs> <laughs> but inside that space, you know, it's important, you know, and, and so it's important for me to have that space, um, mentally, yeah. um, as well as I'll, I'll be much better off with my furniture with a, with a focus space. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel the same way. It's, it's, I'm a slob everywhere else in here. Everything is meticulously <laughs> organized. And apparently the, the other day, um, my son and wife were in here looking for zip ties and they couldn't find them. And my son was just saying, there's no way dad does not have a drawer with the label zip ties on. And, <laughs> and it's like, that is the one thing that is in a jar on the shelf that you just can't find. And everybody makes fun of me, but this is, this is my space. This is my yeah. workspace. This is my, and even right now it's, it's disorderly and it, it, I have found it. It has affected my mood throughout the entire week. No doubt. The fact that it's, yep. it's not right. You know, your, so. your surroundings affect you. That yeah. is, that is absolutely true. And, and, you know, my shops in the past um, and kind of what you see behind me is all about that. It's all about, um, everything makes a noise. Every object makes a noise, you know, uh, a visual noise. And I want to be as quiet as I can when I'm making my furniture. So I try to eliminate as much noise as possible in, in that, you know, little 10 by 10. So I, mm-hmm. nothing's in there that, that isn't, I, I don't need, you know, it's, uh, it's on the outside of that. It's piled in, in piles on the outside of that 10 by 10 space, you know? So, so, so you don't, when, when you're working, you don't have podcast blasting like everyone else. Uh, I do. I, I listen okay. to uh, shop right. talk live, but, oh, okay. uh, yeah. Nice, nice. <laughs> yeah. but, but it's, uh, everything is how I want it. I don't know. It yeah. just keeps, it keeps, helps, keeps me tight, you know, cause mm-hmm. I, I want my furniture and my tools to be tight. It, it, having that space tight keeps me tight. Um, even, even if that isn't necessarily, you know, how it is 20 yeah. feet away. It's, uh, so, so I'm really looking forward to moving in and, and, uh, setting it up. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll have to wander back over with some video cameras and please and yep. get a tour. Um, yeah. This episode is brought to you by Shaper Tools, makers of the Shaper Origin, the handheld CNC router that brings digital precision to the craft of woodworking. Tackle joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, and more with speed and precision. Try it risk-free in your shop for 30 days. Visit shapertools.com to learn more. Make the most of your time in the workshop every day with a Fine Woodworking Magazine subscription. This holiday season, we're running special discounts you won't want to miss. Go to finewoodworking.com and click subscribe to claim your holiday savings. So question number, the probably our last question that we'll have time for is from Woody. Um, do you have any firsthand experience on how wooden smoothing planes, Cronovian or Japanese Kanas, compare to metal body planes? I've heard that the physical feedback is quite different and have been tempted by these ridiculously thin shavings from the Japanese plane seen on YouTube. I know Ron Hawk sells a plane kit a la Krenoff, but I wonder if the performance is less determined by the body and more by the blade. Do you see any benefits in use of wooden plane over metal ones? Um, Andrew does. I know that. Uh, is there a big diff- Is there a big surface quality difference between Krenoff planes and Japanese planes? Uh, it'd be great if you could get Andrew Hunter to chime in. Well, Andrew Hunter. Yes. What say he? Um, well, yes. Wooden body planes. Yes. I'm a fan of. And, uh, so, um, the blade, but, but all that, you know, it, it really has to do with your tuning of, of the plane too. You know, it's, uh, you need it all to work. You can't just have a sharp blade if your if your sole is not flat, you know, or if you have a really large uh, throat opening, you know, those are all going to affect the quality of of, of the, the surface. Um, but what really sets Japanese planes apart, I, I think, is the blade itself. Um, and, and like I said before, it's it's straight straight out of uh, samurai sword technology. You know, it's it's that same mentality. Um, a lifetime of dedication from blacksmiths, 
uh, to improve their skills and hand them down generation after generation, you know, a thousand years back. Uh, that's who's making these planes that I'm buying, you know, and they are affordable uh, compared to, you know, relatively speaking, paying $300 uh, for a Japanese uh, plane is, is an unbelievable value, uh, yeah. seeing the amount of skill that goes into making them. Um, so they, the, the, um, uh, in the question previous, um, he was making a comment about, you know, a $40 blade, you know, you could, you could, uh, you can get away with just spending $40 and, and make your own wooden body, um, w- which I agree. Um, but as a professional, um, I, I just assume pay $300, you know, it, it's, it's this, this relationship, um, when you buy a Western plane for $300, uh, you can get a replacement blade for $40 that puts the value of the plane mostly in the body. Um, yeah, okay. Yep. When you buy a Japanese plane, a $300 Japanese plane, you can get a new body for $50, which okay. puts all of the value, uh, in my opinion, where it should be in the blade. Um, because everything else, uh, I can, I can adjust, I can deal with, but that, that blade, um, is what does the cutting. And that's, that's where I want to spend my money. Um, and Japanese blades, uh, are different. They, they are blacksmith made. They are made one at a time. Um, you know, this, it's still a cottage industry. I mean, that, that's the thing about Japan. It, it really, um, the cultural you know, or the, uh, industrial revolution is, is just coming, you know, just starting to affect those cottage in, in industries in, in mm-hmm. this generation, you know, those, those blacksmiths who are now 80 years old learned from their dad, um, who worked until he was 80, um, and they've passed it down. You know, that, that link is honestly, uh, in danger. Um, of breaking. I was, yeah. So, so, so same as there are, um, a lack of enthusiasts or a lack of people using the planes is, do you feel like there's a lack of the next generation to make I, the, the plane? I the do. Blades? I absolutely do. Okay. Uh, and, oh. and the, the lack of this generation committing themselves, uh, to, <laughs> to work every day in a, in a dingy, dark <laughs> blacksmith yeah, yeah. hole, uh, and and dedicate themselves to a piece of metal um, for their life. That's that's um, that's lacking uh, yeah. in, in in the modern area, which is understandable. But um, yeah. it it means that that all that quality, all of that um, skill that has been passed down is is in peril, and that's that's what gets me, you know, out of the shop trying to teach people, you know, yeah. um, that's, that's why I, I really want to work hard. That's why I'm working with Kazerika USA. Um, that's where I, why I get out and teach um, is because I want to save this, you know, it, it's like being in Europe um, 200 years ago when there were all this information, all these hand tools were being used and wooden bodies and all this skill and knowledge was there. Um, and to know that that was for the most part, going to disappear in the next hundred years. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how I see Japan. You know, I, I see a thousand years of, of culture um, in danger. Uh, and, and so I, I really, I want to make sure it's, it's preserved, you know, and, and, and other people do too. And, and so, so it really is about the blade. Um, so what, what, okay. So maybe we should go over the physical characteristics of yep. a Japanese plane blade and why they are so skillfully made or why, yeah, why so much yeah. skill. Why, is why, why, why different? Um, yeah. And, and they're very similar to a Western blade again, 200 years ago, um, um, before, um, basically in the industrial, um, you know, um, change. So it's, it's, uh, they're made by a blacksmith. Uh, they're laminated. They use an extremely fine, hard piece of steel, uh, laminated to a softer piece of steel. Um, you're using less steel. You're use, you can use a harder steel. Um, because as, as you use a harder steel, it becomes more brittle. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you made a, a blade out of extremely hard steel without that soft backing material, it would be too brittle and it would vibrate um, and chip. Basically, so so that's uh, the the soft steel dampens um, a lot of the heat and a lot of the vibration, okay, uh, and allows that harder steel to be even harder in, in a Japanese blade. So Japanese blades are generally in the Rockwell 63, 64, um, which is much you know much harder than a than a Western um, um, blade. 
typically, mm -hmm. e even a hawk, um, which is a great blade. Um, but but it's it's uh, and and that harder blade again takes more care to use, and it takes more skill to use because it is it is more brittle and is more fragile in, in a sense, um, and needs to be paid attention to more. Um, many of the things that go into a modern blade are not in a Japanese blade because they don't make it sharper. You know, um, a Japanese blade can rust <laughs> um, because you know the chromium isn't put in to prevent it from rusting because it doesn't make it sharper. You know, it's uh, uh -huh. um, a lot of the the tempers. Uh, the tempers are very sensitive. You know, in in the blacksmithing um, in modern steels, a lot of alloys are made to make that temper less sensitive. But it also means you can't get as much out of the blade because of that. So uh, these are compromises we've made um, to sort of um, reach a larger, you know, in, in the West, reach a larger public. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the amateur woodworker is is uh, is what many of the the, the tools are being made for um, today, uh, which is great because it's getting people involved. But uh, for the professional who wants these tools, I want more. You know, and. Uh, and and those Japanese tools give give me more, um, and uh, yeah. So so it's you know you can have a great blade, uh, and you can have your 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 you know your sole flat and or not flat uh, profiled, um, and you can pay all the attention, but you need to sharpen it too. <laughs> yeah. So so really sharpening, um, it's all about sharpening, and and that's that's again patience, that's knowing that. Uh, if I learn this skill, I'm going to be able to do more. Um, but I'm going to have to sit down and do this tedious thing called sharpening uh, and, and learn how to do it but before I can go further. Um, and that's that's okay by me. You know, I, I love sharpening. Well, and there's there's sharpen and I you know I feel like we could do a whole another episode yeah. on sharpening. Um, also, with Japanese planes, there's another maintenance. Uh, we've we've done a video on it with you uh, tapping out, yeah. right? Can yep. you explain what that is a little bit? Yep. Um, and 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 let me let me say that for the for the listening audience, this this might sound crazy. Uh, I will I will post a link to to the video of Andrew demonstrating this. Um, but this also speaks on the relationship that you have with this tool, right? For, yep. So what, what is tapping out? Um, well, let, let me first say that a Japanese, um, the blade itself, the bottom, like I said, it's laminated. Uh, so the, the bottom of, the, of the, the blade is all hard steel. And like I said, really, really, really hard steel. Um, so when you go to flatten that bottom, for you to flatten two inches of Rockwell 64, it's just not going to happen. Um, so what, what the Japanese blade has done, it has hollowed out most of that, except for the very edge, you know, the front edge and the side edges where it needs to sit. Um, everything else is slightly hollowed out. So when you go to flatten the back, you're only, um, touching steel, uh, where you, where you need to, which is in the front of the blade, um, to create a sharp, you know, edge. Um, and the rest you're not even touching it. You're not having to deal with it. It's that same idea of taking away, um, Basically, the, the idea of a, a concavity, you know, you're working with a convex surface as opposed to a perfectly flat surface, puts the contacts right on the edges. And that's where yeah. the sharpening happens, right on the edge. Yeah. You know, you can polish the middle of the blade all you want. Your bevel can be so shiny. But if that tip wasn't sharpened well, the blade is not sharp. Um, so so that, that allows that. So hall, um, tapping out. Eventually, uh, as you use the blade, as you sharpen the bevel, you'll, you'll wear it away and eventually reach that hollow. So one, one technique, um, one reason to tap out um, is, to, is to fill that hollow back in. I, I should explain what tapping out is. You yeah. take your hammer <laughs> and you hit your new blade with the hammer <laughs> uh, <laughs> to make it work better. Um, which which normally is that 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 no. hitting a blade with a hammer is yes yeah, that's that's yeah, a hard sell that's a hard upon. sell that's a hard so, sell exactly so uh, again it goes it's because it's a laminated blade you know there's only a, a sixteenth of hard steel on the very bottom of the plane the rest you know the rest quarter of an inch three eighths of an inch is soft mild steel yeah. so what that means is you can use that soft mild steel to adjust the shape of the hard steel um, okay so if so if you get um, you know, uh, a Western plane 
which is all, you know, um, all hard. Um, yeah. and you, f- you go to flatten the back and you find out that it's, it's, it's got a, you know, a low spot in the middle. You're not, you know, you your do the only recourse trick. is, is, is to keep trick. grinding or yeah, <laughs> yeah like, yeah, like exactly. to just sit there and, yeah. and grind or the rule yeah. trick. You're right. Okay. Gotcha. So, so with a Japanese blade, um, and in fact, this is, I, the bottom of the plane isn't necessarily flat. Again, I, I tap it out. I hammer on the soft steel right above uh, on the bevel. Again, watch the video, but uh, right above the bevel. And I push the whole front of that um, plane blade down. The whole tip of the plane blade gets pushed down. So now the bottom is concaved a little bit, ever so slightly, ever so slightly. But it means when I go to put that on the stone, it's touching right to the front and a little bit in the back, which I don't put pressure on. So you don't put a little groove. All my pressure's to the front. All the cut goes right to the front. It it makes my sharpening so much more efficient. Um, putting the cut where you want it. Again, it's it's about focusing um, your energy to where you want it most and getting rid of everything else. Is you know? is this is this a part of that initial setup that that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. You know when you when you first get that um, plane blade in the mail. Um, it doesn't necessarily, uh, it isn't necessarily perfectly flat. Again, that last 10%, the blacksmith is leaving to you because uh, you care about it, you know? And, uh, and that's, that's, you know, if you, if you rub it on your perfectly flat stone and you find that that one little corner is up, you can either go ahead and flatten everything until you reach that corner, which is extremely labor intensive. And you start Where filling in, bit, yeah. yeah, you start filling in your hollow and losing the efficiency. So instead, I will take a hammer and I will tap on the soft steel above that corner and it will bend the hard steel down in that corner so that when I go put it on the stone, now it's flat. And I didn't have to do any grinding to make it flat. So again, um, I want this, you know, and it's not about the Japanese tools to me. It's about these technologies that I want to apply to Western tools. I want to apply to to the world's tools. You know, I don't don't want Eastern tools and Western tools. I want tools that work well Um, Mm -hmm. and to work well a laminated blade um, is really important, I think, um, because again, it puts me in control of my blade. Um, and, and a wooden body, I think, is really important because it puts me in control of the body, as opposed to, um, you know, you know, hoping that someone else did a good job on it. You know, it, it allows me to to adjust things and be in control of of my tool, which allows you to take it as far as you want. You know, there's it's yeah. So. Yeah, so like, it's obviously not for everyone. Nope. But yeah. But, but there's definitely something that everyone can learn from and benefit from these these techniques and these tools. And I, I don't know. I, just, I personally, I think, like, I sit there and go, "Oh man, I got to sign up for that class," you know, because um, there is there's something that just is so mesmerizing about the idea of, of the relationship that you build with a tool where you get it and you complete it. Yeah. You know, it's useless until you, until you finish it. Yeah. And, um, and, yeah, and, and just, I, and over it's the time of its life as it wears out, you know, if my throat opening opens up on my Japanese or uh, on a wooden plane, yeah. you know, um, if, if your throat opening you know, becomes too wide. You just route a little <laughs> space and you put in a new piece of wood because we're woodworkers. It's like um, for the life of the tool, um, I, ca- I can maintain it because it's wooden. Yeah. You know, um, so there's you know, and and again, that's because the tool works better. It's going to make my experience um, using it better, and I'm going to enjoy that more. And uh, so you, you know, so that's that's why I want to teach it. But it's not. I want everyone to sit on the floor and start doing Japanese woodworking. It's yeah. I want people to enjoy hand tool woodworking more. Uh, and I see issues with some of the tools that people are buying that they could be improved upon. Mm-hmm. Um, and that improvement would make more enjoyment. You know, it's not, it's not that they, their finish will be better. Um, they will just struggle less <laughs> yeah. and, and be more likely to go to the shop uh, and use their hand tools as opposed to being like, I can't get this finish right. I have to go plug in my helical planer, you know? Yeah. 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 So, um, maybe last little bit, where's the best place to start with a smoother 
or so um the best place to start is small um because just like i said all of these things need adjustment um and when you the larger your plane is the the more you know the larger the area is to flatten the harder it is to flatten um yeah. so the smaller the area you know the smaller the plane the easier it is to uh learn these techniques get them right and then graduate to a larger plane uh and and that's mostly the width of the blade that's that's yeah, pretty okay. much how how japanese uh tools are sold uh according to the width of their blade uh and you tune it according to how you tune the body according to how okay. you're going to use it you know you don't necessarily so so, buy a, so you you could buy the same thing and you might tune it to be um uh, the equivalent to a scrub plane or mm -hmm. the equivalent yep. to a smoother or, yep. okay. or a jointer, gotcha. you know, you know yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's all, uh, it's all, it's all up to me and how it's, how it's tuned. Hmm. Um, so, so I, I, my classes I teach, um, I use a 48 millimeter or a 54 millimeter. <clears throat> um, also these are sold. I, I should say too, I, I really prefer buying from, um, American tool companies, uh, or, uh, you know, companies that are, uh, in the States that are selling Japanese tools because okay. I want more tools <laughs> in the States being sold. Yeah. Um, so Suzuki, uh, tool, um, and Hida tool are both in California. Uh, uh -huh. and I tend to use, use their planes, uh, Suzuki, uh, um, in particular are, are the, the planes I use in my classes. Uh, and again, like I said, 48 millimeter, 54 those are sold as a block plane, as a smaller okay. um, plane, and they're less expensive. Uh, and then you get up into 65, 60, um, 70 millimeter. Uh, and those are a little bit more refined and a little bit more expensive. And that, that, that I would say would be the next step. Um, okay. But in, in starting out with a good quality, you know, don't go $50 <laughs> on, a, yeah. you know, on any plane, you know. But, you know, also don't buy this thousand dollar plane that you're afraid of. You know, that's not going to help you either. Yeah. Um, OK. Start with one hundred and fifty two hundred dollar plane and um, get 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 my fine woodworking article and uh, or sign up for a class and, and yeah. get it tuned and start using it and, you know, graduate to the next one. You know, you'll you'll have an array of them by the time you're done. You know, so so. Um Okay, so this episode will probably air after your class at Bob's, mm -hmm. uh, and you you do them from time to time. Um, hopefully, when things ease up, do you plan on on teaching other places or um, all over? Yeah, I, I definitely okay. feel like I've been hiding for the last okay. five years or so, working on the house, raising kids. Yeah, um, my my son Jack. Uh, well, both both kids are now getting on the bus and going to uh, school. So I feel like there's a lot of change happening in my life. Good. Uh, which means I'm going to be getting out a lot more. Um, and there's even going to be space in my own shop to have uh, classes. So, so definitely uh, you will see more of me and, and hopefully I'll be writing some more articles with you guys. And um, yeah, just, just coming out of my, coming out of my, wherever I was. <laughs> and, and anyone interested should definitely check out um, the Kasurikai website and the group. Yeah. Is there, is, is, is that a membership thing? Can you. It is. So, a, so the, it's, um, it's best to get a membership. It's inexpensive. Um, and that way you're basically on the mailing list of things going on. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you get a discount on classes. Um, okay. so right now we're doing all the zoom classes. Uh, and when we do live events, you'll get, uh, discounts on that too, but mostly it's, it connects you to us and we, yeah. we now have your name. And, uh, when we have great ideas or things to share, we can get it out to people. Um, so that would be great if you could put a link for uh, absolutely Erica absolutely. in the in the, in the yeah. I send me a, a list of links and we'll we'll make it all happen. And awesome. you know, I guess I guess the hopefully this uh, this makes some people curious and 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 seek out more information. There's there's a whole world of of uh, of skills and tools and techniques to learn from uh from all over the place so yeah. thank you for sharing them and we'll, we'll have you back on and we'll thank you, you know, for the opportunity ben. there's yeah. we didn't even touch saws we didn't talk about chisels we, we didn't touch, so there's <laughs> there's plenty more of this there uh, so if uh if you have questions on japanese hands let's let's say the next one's gonna be uh handsaw based so send those questions in uh shop talk at taunton.com and uh we'll we'll have andrew back on awesome, awesome. thank you ben all right, that does it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. 
Thank you to everyone who sent in questions. Even if they're waiting in a folder to be answered, they are important to making this show go. And another thing that's important to making this show go is leaving comments and reviews on the iTunes page. It helps us be seen by other people, other woodworkers who might be interested in a dorky woodworking podcast like this one. And first and foremost, findwoodworking.com members and findwoodworking subscribers. Y'all are the ones who pay the bills around here. Thank you so much. If you have any questions you'd like to answer on the show, send them into shoptalkatalk.com. We will be back in two weeks with another episode. Thank you so much for listening. Bye.